Well, the genesis of this book was a journey that I made across Tibet in 1996. And we came from Chengdu in western China uh, to Lhasa and on to Kathmandu during the dreadful spring when the debacle happened on Mount Everest. It was famously chronicled by John Krakauer in his wonderful book, Into Thin Air. And my colleague on that journey, my close friend Dan Taylor, was very concerned about how the commercialization of Everest had led to such unnecessary loss of life. And the very next year, on, in the fall of 1997, Dan Taylor and I found ourselves on the east face of Everest in the legendary Gama Valley, uh, trying to photograph snow leopards for the National Geographic. And Daniel suddenly began to speak of these Englishmen in tweeds who had read Shakespeare to each other in the snow at 23,000 feet, the story of George Mallory and his comrades who attempt to climb Mount Everest in 1921, 22, and 24. And I became instantly sort of enamored of who these men were. And of course, the basic story is well known to people. Um, Britain having famously lost as an empire of explorers the race to the North and South Pole, suddenly the summit of Everest, sort of looming as a third pole above the empire of the Raj, uh, captured their imagination. And the quest to climb Mount Everest became almost a, a gesture of redemption for this empire of explorers that had lost the race to the North and South Poles. But from the very start, and of course the fundamental story of Mallory is that the British in 1921 literally had to walk off the map 400 miles just to come near a mountain that no European had previously approached at close quarters. And then in 22 and 24, having found the doorway to the mountain, the chink in its armor, as they described, they set out to assault it, to reach the summit. And then famously on June 8, 1924, George Mallory, age 37, the most illustrious climber in the British Empire, and his young protege, Sandy Irvin, a lad of but 22, were seen by Noel O'Dell cresting the Northeast Ridge, going strong for the summit when the mist rolled in and enveloped their memory and myth. And the story that has always haunted British mountaineers have been, has been, you know, did Mallory get to the top before he met his end? But from the very start, I wasn't interested in that question. I wanted to know who these men were and what had carried them aloft. And I knew from just their age and their social background that almost all of them, all 26 who went to Everest on those three expeditions, would have gone through the agony of the Western Front during the Great War. And my idea was that they had seen so much of death that death had no hold over them. They had nothing more to teach them save that of their own. Not that they were cavalier about death, but they were perhaps willing to take, accept a level of risk that would have been unimaginable before the war and a level of risk that Everest demanded. And in a sense, my, my idea that, and the idea that really informed the entire 12 year process of writing this book was that for that generation, life mattered less than the moments of being alive. And so the first thing I did in this incredible period of process of research was to set out to try to find out where each of those 26 men had been every day of the four years and four months of the war. And that may seem like an impossible task, but as the British famously said after the Battle of Passchendaele and the Battle of the Somme, the British army lacked the clerk power to tabulate the dead. Well, if that was true, they kept records of about just about everything else, and that war was so thoroughly chronicled that it was a wonder men found time to fight. And also, because the zone of operations was so surprisingly small, the entire British zone of operations was never larger than the English county of Lincolnshire. The British front upon which millions of men would fight and hundreds of thousands die was never longer than 125 miles. For much of the war it was 85 miles long, yet behind that frontage the British would build with, of course, their, 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 their comrades in the Indian Army, the Canadian Army, the Australian Army, and to the south, the French armies, and the north, the Belgium armies. But just before, behind the British sector of the front, the British would build 6,000 miles of trenches, 6,000 miles of railroad. The Ypres salient that the British fought over throughout the entire war, an area of land that a man could walk around in a long day or two, uh, would see the death of 1.7 million boys over the course of the war.
And because the zone of operations was so small, and because so many millions of men flowed through it, and because in the wake of the war there was a tsunami of this cathartic release of literature, journals, poetry and prose, um, memoirs, letters. There was no point in that battlefield that hadn't been chronicled in multiple voices every day of the war. So not only was it possible to find out where each of our men had been every day of the war, it was possible to ascertain with a level of specificity that would have been unimaginable to me before the beginning of the war what horrors they had been exposed to. And in the end, it turned out that of the 26 men who went to Everest, fully 20 saw the worst of the fighting. Four were surgeons at the front, uh, two lost brothers. One was had his spirit crushed and spent much of the war in an asylum suffering from shell shock. All had borne witness to the carnage, the, the bones and barbed wire, the white faces of the dead. And so that, that was really the sort of the, the world that they carried with them, both in memory, in spirit, but also in reality. Jack Hazard, who climbed to the top of the North Pole in 19... 24 did so with open wounds from the Somme, saturating his climbing tunic. So the war literally carried them and into the mountains. And so in the wake of the war, the, the effort to climb Everest really became a mission of regeneration for an entire nation bled white by war. The book isn't just about the Great War. It, the Great War, in a way the book is a biography of all 26 men who went to Everest and the war just becomes a backdrop of their lives. Let, let me explain with one uh, interesting example. One of the great um, discoveries I made during the course of the research for the book was that there was an unsung hero, a Canadian by the name of Oliver Wheeler, who was a Royal Engineer, seconded to the Survey of India, by the Survey of India to the expedition. I found his son living not five doors from the house I was born in, in Vancouver. And I went to see him, and in the course of a, a wonderful interview, he pulled off the shelf two fat journals that his father had kept as he walked across Tibet in 1921 with George Mallory. And this was a big discovery for me, because according to all the British historians, only one climber, a fellow called Guy Bullock, Mallory's friend from Winchester, had kept a journal in 1921, a rather curt thing that had been published by the Alpine Club in 1962. So this journal, unknown journal, was a huge discovery for me. But it was a discovery for two reasons. First of all, it gave me enormous confidence that the others who had written about Everest had not exhausted the story, not to, in the slightest. But more importantly, I knew that journal was going to be full of interesting information. and so. On the approach march to Everest in 1921, there was a high-altitude physiologist by the name of Arthur Kellis, 56 years old, too old for Everest, and he literally died of exhaustion and was buried in the shadow of Kampazong, a fortress on the Tibetan plateau. Now, on the day that he is buried, Wheeler's entry into his journal reads very simply, well, they buried the old boy in the morning, thought it would be the afternoon, Sorry to have missed it, but I do hate funerals. Well, wait a minute. How do you miss the internment of one of the five men you're walking across Tibet with on a mountaineering expedition? There had to be a, a deeper explanation. And I knew it would be found on the Western Front. Now, Wheeler was a soldier soldier. He graduated from the Canadian equivalent of Sandhurst or West Point, the Royal Military College in Kingston, at the very top of his class. At the outbreak of hostilities, he was a Royal Engineer in India attached to the 7th Mur Division. Now, the British Expeditionary Force sent to France in August of 1914 was only four divisions and they were essentially eliminated, uh, uh, destroyed by November of 1914. And the entire British sector of the front was held by the Canadians in the north and the Indian Army in the south. Wheeler reached the front in November of 1914. By this point in time, the topography of Armageddon was in place. The trenches went from the Swiss border to the English channel, ch channel, and both sides were beginning to sap each other, putting perpendicular trenches toward the enemy line so you could attack more readily. It came to the attachment of Wheeler's command, 
in the Indian Army, the 7th Merit Division, that the Germans had put two saps within 30 feet of their front line. Wheeler and his Indian colleagues and comrades were given the order to go over the top, bury those saps, and do so in a way that would dissuade the Germans ever trying that again. They go over the top, all hell breaks loose, and to their horror they discover the saps are full of Germans about to attack them. The result is a ferocious melee of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Eventually the Indians push the Germans back, but not before the trench is lined three bodies deep, chest to chest, of boys of both sides in their death throes, flailing about, as Wheeler would write, like trout in my creel. He tries to get the wounded out, but in all the chaos of battle, the artillery, the very lights, the machine gun fire, the, the rain, the cold, the blackness of night, he never knows how many were left behind and how many he had had to bury alive. So when he says on Tibet, in Tibet, I do hate funerals, you begin to see the way the war plays out in their lives. It was something they never spoke about, but it was never forgotten. No one ever spoke about the war. T.E. Lawrence and Robert Graves made a deal never to speak about it, but how could it not have been the backdrop of their lives? You know, and so, so the whole point of my book was to sort of not ask whether Mallory got to the top, but to look at these remarkable men through the lens of history and appreciate just who they were. And I suppose one inspiration for the book was the fact that these were men of my grandfather's age, of his generation. My own grandfather had been a surgeon at a casualty clearing station behind the front. I never met my grandfather. He was killed. But, you know, it was his duty every day to separate the dead from the living. In other words, soldiers would come back by their thousands, and he had to look at a young boy, and if the soldier was so badly wounded that he was destined to die, the nurses would just put a red cross on his forehead, and he'd go to the moribund tent. If the soldier was wounded but could possibly walk or be carried, he went right to the hospital trains. And then men like my grandfather devoted their attention to those who would die if they were not operated on immediately. It's hard to imagine what stress that must have created. Howard Somerville, Mallory's closest friend on the mountain, was a surgeon in the war at a casualty clearing station, as had been my grandfather. He famously, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, July 1st, 1916, walked out of his tent, one of two surgeons, on a six-hour six hour shift, having been told to expect maybe a thousand casualties over the course of the entire battle, he walked out to find himself surrounded by six acres of dying boys on stretchers. So it was very much um, to look back and understand who these men were. And what's fascinating about this whole generation is that, you know, there were men so confident in their masculinity that they could speak of love between men without shame, yet they were men of discretion and decorum. They were not prepared to litter the world with themselves or to yield their feelings to analysis. Uh, at the same time, they were so confident in their masculinity that they could be collecting a butterfly for science in the morning or a plant specimen, painting a watercolor before lunch, discussing Keats and Shelley and Shakespeare in the early afternoon and still getting ready and be pre being prepared to assault the flanks of Everest at dusk or indeed the German line. No, I don't think they were chosen for the, I mean, they were chosen for the mission. Um, you know, one of the things that we forget is that, you know, climbing in pre-war Britain was, was very much part of the culture of Oxford and Cambridge and the the upper educated classes, as much as cricket or, or theater was. And during the war, such was a carnage on the front that every month the British Army required 10,000 junior officers simply to replace the litany of the dead. Now think about that. In the entire, what, 10, 12 years now, the Afghanistan and Iraq conflicts, the entire U.S. Army has not lost 10,000 men and women in battle. Uh, that was every month in the British Army in the Great War. And so the public schools that to a great extent fed into the Army, the junior officers, you know, all of these schools, Marble would lose 
733 men. I mean, they would graduate entire senior classes directly to the front. And, and so, um, in the wake of the war, uh, so many climbers had been lost. Uh, you know, there was a gathering before the war of climbers and poets and philosophers in the mountains of Wales at a place called Penny Pass, where they would climb by day and recite poetry by night and sort of dream all these impossibly innocent dreams of a, of a new century of freedom that they were looking forward to. And of those climbers who were portrayed in the small photographic portraits in the Penny Pass photo album, no fewer than 26 would die in the war, and something like 11 or 12 be completely maimed by the war. So as Tom Longstaff, a kind of a veteran Himalaya climber, uh, said laconically in a letter to Arthur Hinks, who was the secretary of the Everest Committee, the committee that was pulling together the expeditions for the mountain, he said, you know, the supply of young climbers is not what it was before the war. So to a great extent, they had to grab whoever they could. George Mallory had survived, but many had not. 